Uh, thank you. Appreciate the uh, invitation. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, lapnison after a, a failed uh, TIF uh, procedure, and then I'm going to stir the pot a little bit. Uh, so these are my disclosures, uh, none of which are really relevant uh, to uh, to this talk. So what are what are my objectives here? We're going to basically put the uh, approach to uh, lapnison after a failed uh, TIF procedure. Uh, using the esophagus uh, device, remove, review the outcomes of Nissen after TIF, and discuss uh, a comparison of Nissen and TIF. So, as another disclosure, I was an early enthusiast of TIF. I mean, here, this was a paper almost eight years uh, old, uh, where uh, we looked at our initial uh, series of 20, uh, 20 some patients, and you can See over here, the symptom scores improved great, except when they didn't, then they were about the same. And quality of life scores improved. And that was great early on, and I was thinking, man, this is it. I'm loving it. I can do it endoscopically. I like being out of the box, so it was great. And then the recurrent symptoms started. So this particular uh, patient uh, did a TIF on, everything went great, had great relief of uh, symptoms. The post-op esophagram looked wonderful and then within uh, several months uh, started complaining about recurrent symptoms. And as always, when you ever have recurrent symptoms, they do a complete, uh, complete evaluation, upper GI series, upper endoscopy. And on the upper endoscopy, you know, it didn't look that much different than before. Monometry did show a hypotensive lower esophageal sphincter and 24-hour pH monitoring did have pathologic reflux with a good symptom correlation because occasionally when people have uh, symptoms after a uh, fundoplication, uh, they may be having a functional problem, but that was not the case here. So there we go. Is this supposed to how we get that started? Oh, here, okay. Well, what happened there? Can we get the video started, please? So. Okay, good. So here you can see the, the, the fasteners have pulled through and, and there's still that halo hernia which wasn't picked up before. And I want you to pay attention to where those fasteners are. The fasteners are in the, uh, the fat pad and the phrenoesophageal ligament. Not a lot of inflammation. Take everything down uh, fairly, uh, fairly normally. And this is something that's uh, kind of interesting uh, when we have now done several of these uh, redos after TIF. There is some Sometimes you see a lot of inflammation, most of the times you don't. You see where the, uh, where the fasteners have kind of essentially pulled through. Uh, the fundus is up there a little bit, and now we are going over here to the, uh, to the left cruise and getting that taken down. I really like to free up this uh, angle of his uh, area. And again, notice not a lot of inflammation, not a lot of scar tissue. And this was, I would say, about maybe eight, eight or nine months after her original TIF procedure. And we see as there we're getting that left side dissected out. And now we start working over here on the uh, on the right cruise. Like to get the business side of that blade away from the esophagus. And we can see the left cruise posteriorly get that retroesophageal space uh, dissected out. Get our pin rows to uh, lasso the esophagus. And we start putting our stitches in to uh, repair the cruise. Again, no, it's not a whole lot of inflammation, not a whole lot of scar tissue, pretty, uh, pretty straight, uh, straightforward uh, fund fundoplication. You're, you're 
sometimes it can be a little more challenging than this, but most of the times it's just, just like this. And this is where I start yelling at the resident not to stick the vena cava with the needle. And then do a, a standard front application. You can see kind of up in here, this is where, see some scar tissue there from where the, uh, the uh, eye fasteners have actually pulled through the esophagus because that's where they were uh, replaced. And we finish up with a regular just fun, distant fund application. And this lady did, uh, did, did well. So uh, with uh, Kyle and uh, a few other people from uh, Ohio, we, re we reviewed uh, our experience with uh, seven lapnissons after, after TIFFs. Uh, see, the, uh, there is a, a range of time of where, they, where the recurrent uh, symptoms happen, usually within uh, a few months. It can up be even past two years. But it was pretty straightforward to do. Uh, and, uh, not too much, not, did not add a lot of difficulty, no real complications. So pretty straightforward to do a lapnison after, uh, after a TIF. Shouldn't be too, too scary. Occasionally it is. So the real question is, how good is TIF compared to a lapnison? There is no direct randomized control trials comparing TIF to lapnison, nor for that matter links to, uh, to, uh, to a nissen. And so there is this uh, statistical technique called a network meta-analysis. And, uh, and I have the good fortune at the University of South Florida to work with uh, Joel Richter, who many of you know, uh, a, a uh, world famous esophagologist, and, this, and we have a group that we uh, call our Center for uh, Evidence-Based Medicine. And what a network meta-analysis does is that if you have randomized trials comparing, in this case, Nissen versus uh, proton pump inhibitors, there were three randomized trials, and you also have randomized trials that was mentioned comparing PPIs to TIF. Can you then make some inference between TIF and, and Nissen? And that's what this technique, uh, uh, statistical technique does. So what we did is that we, we looked at this and did our network of meta-analysis. And what we end up finding is that for every objective measure, pH uh, less than 4, LES pressure, and the persistence of esophagitis, Nissen wins out over, over TIF. Now, interestingly, on the uh, quality of life scales, TIF was a little bit better, uh, but that is explained be with a technique that is done called a meta-regression, and this is actually an illusion just because the follow-up period for the TIFs were so short at, the, at that time compared to the randomized trials of Nissen versus, uh, versus PPI. So the question is, why is TIF failing? And as was shown in the uh, previous uh, talk uh, by uh, Kevin, this is what we think we're doing. We think we're taking the serosa of the, uh, of the stomach and putting it right up against the, uh, the longitudinal muscles of the esophagus and we're, and we're basically juxtaposing those and that's what we think we're doing. But I don't think that's what we're doing. Because in real life, what you have there is the frenoesophageal ligament, you have a thick esophageal fat pad, and simply there is just too much tension for those eye fasteners to uh, overcome in the, uh, in the long term in many patients. Now, I'm not going to sit here, stand up here and tell you that it's prob it doesn't work in, every, it, in everybody. I'm sure it does, and I'm sure the more eye, eye fasteners you put in, probably the better it's going to be. But this is just an anatomic problem that simply is not going to be addressed by TIF or, for that matter, any other uh, endoluminal uh, uh, technique. So the real question is, yes, laparoscopic Nissen after TIP, straightforward, do it, not a problem, have at it, have fun. The bigger question is, should we be doing a TIF at all? And that's, uh, that I'm going to be happy to, uh, to uh, debate about since I guess we have extra time. Absolutely. So with that, I'll conclude.